and the late Dr. Leo Bastad, the former chair of the Washington State, sorry, that's the place. Uh, veterinarians program, veterinary program, who believe that inmate rehabilitation can be facilitated by the human animal bond. Sister Pauline and Bastad work cooperatively together in the Washington State University, Tacoma Community College, and the Washington State uh, Department of Corrections to create the innovative program with the Washington Women's Correctional Center. As of 1982, the Global Community College's Inmate Education Program, the Pet Partnership Program, became the nonprofit organization. This program benefits all involved. They not only have the training part, which the cost of making a service pet or creating a service pet is approximately $10,000 per animal with eight months of training, if not more. Now, all these animals they save from the rescue don't get to make it as service dogs. And about one in every 15 or 20 get to be service dogs. The others, they just train them really well to be, they call them for old pets. Because they, if they don't make it as a service dog, they don't get put back to sleep. And they turn around and become good dogs, <coughs> obedient, because they're smart enough to be that. But they might not be able to make it as a service pet. <coughs> Anyway, in the prison, the, not only the, the pets help the inmates cope with time and everything else, my friend saw a lot of love for animals that my, her mom didn't have before she went in. So I guess it really does help the bonding process. Now, you get vocational training in these prisons too. So when you come out, but after you pay your debt to society, you can get a job in these fields grooming, maintenance, taken care of, and the trainers work alongside the prisoners to help them. They might not become trainers, but they know how to train a regular pet. Now, according to Assistance Dog International, the core values of the basic, and the basic mission statement of the partnership program are, enriches the lives of inmates and homeless animals and the community through animal-human bonding. We, um, we value compassion and respect for people and animals. We value commitment to service. We value education and growth. We value the building of partnerships in the community. And with that, I'm going to hand you back over to Emily. Okay. Thank you. So, as you just heard, Alfie has told you basically about what the program is dogs and they also have a boarding and grooming kennel area for the dogs and so women are really gaining a lot of skill. They learn to train, groom, board dogs. They also get clerical skills um, in the office helping with the boarding and everything. And so now I'm going to talk about the significance of this to the life of an inmate. According to the Department of Corrections and Answers.com, Drug offenses are the number one reason that both men and women are in prison. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, 74% of prison inmates have substance abuse and or mental health issues. And the numbers are just about the same for inmates in jail being at 76% of those inmates having these issues. The Department of Justice also states that 27% of prison inmates have been sexually abused in their life. And 39% of these inmates grew up with parents who had substance abuse and mental health issues themselves. Now, of course, I'm not giving these as an excuse as to, you know, a reason as to why these people are in prison. Of course, we have laws for a reason. If we break the law, it's expected that we will have consequences and we will pay the to society, as Alfie said. The main question that I ask is, how effective is it to just lock somebody up and to just have them serve time? It's really not. According to the California Department of Corrections, 45% of felons released from prison end up returning on parole violations. Many of these violations, actually almost all these violations, usually are because of a dirty drug test. Excuse me. 
So a large percentage of these violations were due to substance abuse issues. Yet, 99% of convicted murderers do not return to prison. And so when we're talking about issues being drug offenses and things like that, substance abuse, they're very, very high uh, recidivism, recidivism rate, excuse me. So, and then they say that 64% or two thirds of all prisoners admitted to prison are parole violators. It's estimated that two thirds of all parolees have substance abuse issues, yet few of them were able to participate in the appropriate tre in treatment programs while incarcerated. The recent expert panel on adult offender recidivism, that's a hard word this morning, so excuse me. <laughs> found that 50% of exiting state prisoners did not participate in any rehabilitation or work program, nor did they have a work assignment their entire stay in prison. So you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with the program here in Washington? Well, I'll tell you. According to Purdy's website in 1997, General Schwarzkopf came to the Correction Center to host a function called What's Right in America, it was put on by NBC. He said that the prison partnership program exemplified how the prison system can aid in rehabilitation of inmates while serving the community at the same time. So the PET program gives the women there a purpose, which is something that is extremely important to an inmate to keep their, their life going, to give them some hope for when they, get, when they get out, to know that there is life beyond this. And it's something that really lacks also in prison, or being, having your freedom taken away. You don't feel like you have much, serve much of a purpose. The program, as we said, teaches women to train, groom, and board dogs while they serve their time. It gives them a chance to learn these valuable skills, and it actually gives them a chance to work towards pet care technician certification. And they also can obtain their companion animal hygienist certification under the Worldwide Pet Supply Association. So due to this program at this time, since it started uh, almost 30 years ago, 100% of inmates who participated in the program and then were released obtained employment because of their training, which is extremely important because a really hard thing about being a convicted felon is you get out and this cycle starts. It's very hard to get a job. It's hard to find even a place that will rent an apartment to you or, you know, it's hard to do everything if you're a convicted felon. And so this cycle just continues. You don't have a job, you don't have a way to be a productive member of society, and a lot of times it ends up causing people to fall back into old habits. People don't feel that they are contributing, and they don't feel a purpose, and it's just a very vicious cycle. And also at this time, none of the women who participated in this program returned to prison which is, as you heard from the statistics earlier, just very amazing. In treatment programs and rehabilitation drug programs, the rates are not that. A large amount of the people do end up relapsing if they, if they don't seek the proper support when they are released. And another way that the program is crucial to the rehabilitation of these inmates is the companionship that the dogs provide. Most of you have had dogs, as you just said earlier, and so you know the love and the companionship that you feel. Numerous studies have been conducted on the bond between humans and animals, and you know we know that everybody needs love and acceptance from somebody or something. And so many, many of these inmates haven't received this, maybe in their entire lives or in a very long time. You don't develop close, especially not with human contact, type relationships when you are serving time. It's just the way that it is. People can become institutionalized. It's People kind of forget how to have relationships. You're used to living in a way where you're told what to do, when to get up, how to make your bed, what you can have, what you can't have, when to eat. You don't, you're not used to making decisions for yourself anymore and you don't have those close relationships that are so important and that are very, very important to have when you get out. Excuse me. Uh, so 
dwellings. The dogs offer this unconditional love and companionship. According to WebMD, in just a few minutes with their pets, a person actually goes through physical changes that makes a difference in their mood and stress levels. Cortisol, the hormone that's associated with stress, goes down when people are petting a pet and just cuddling with their dogs. And serotonin and dopamine, the feel-good hormones, seem to go up. Having a pet can significantly reduce the rates of depression, high blood pressure, and obesity. One study showed that dog owners have significantly had a significantly better survival rate within a year after a heart attack, and that overall, pet owners have a lower risk of dying from any cardiac disease, including heart failure. Therapists have been known to prescribe dogs as a means of treatment to, to help depression. Caring for a dog, walking it, grooming it, and, the bond, and playing with it helps to take people outside of themselves, which is very important when you're str struggling from, as Christine was talking about, mental health issues, and you just you can't seem to see the world outside of, of that hole that you're in and what you're feeling. So needless to say, all of these things about the bond between the inmates and the animals is, pri is priceless. These inmates need these close relationships, need to feel a purpose, and of course, gaining these very valuable skills that can help them gain employment upon getting out. And I said earlier I would share about how this is personal to me. I, myself, if you had met me five years ago, you probably would have seen me walking down the street and you wouldn't recognize me. You wouldn't have paid me for some for somebody that my instructor would have asked me to come and share anything with you. Nobody wanted to hear anything from me. <laughs> I suffered from substance abuse issues. And it has been, I mean, it's a diagnosable disease. Under the American Medical Association, it, addiction is considered a disease. Nobody decides to be an addict. You, they have found that there is genetic differences in the brains of addicts and alcoholics. Nobody says when they're a little girl, I definitely didn't growing up. I want to grow up and completely just make my life unmanageable <laughs> and, and disappoint people and throw away my chances at being a productive member of society. And I didn't grow up with a lot of these statistics that I told you about earlier. I had a two-parent home loving, supportive parents without substance abuse issues in my home. And I still managed to go down that path. It's just not something that you ever plan or expect to happen. And things kind of spin out of control before you really have any idea what's going on. So I wasn't in prison, but I was in programs after having suffered uh, with these issues for a long time. And I know what it's like to be on the other side. I know what it's like to feel like you don't serve a purpose. I know how important these programs are for just feeling that hope and, know, and knowing that when you do return to normal society, there's still something left for you. It gives you a reason to, to want to make yourself a better person and to seek the help and to make the changes. This is something that does require a lot of work on the part of the addict or the alcoholic is seeking recovery and seeking a support group and it's, it's hard work. <laughs> and I remember I was given the job of laundry duty and it was four hours a day and it was what I looked forward to. Now I have laundry, <laughs> not what I look forward to. It makes me have your perspective changes. <laughs> when your freedom is taken away, the small things you realize are really what matters. The relationships, the closeness with people that you don't have for a very long time, and serving a purpose, having a job. And so laundry was my job, and four hours every day, I kind of felt like I, I'm worth something. And it's so silly to say that, just from folding the bed linens and the towels, and it was what I looked forward to every day. I woke up in the morning ready to go. I felt like I was still, I was getting a part of myself back that I hadn't felt in a very long time. I was committed to something, which for me was very, very difficult when I was in the midst of active addiction. And we weren't paid, obviously. We got a cup of coffee, and that was just the biggest treat in the world. <laughs> so 
have participated in that. There were also programs such as 12-step 12 12 fellowships that were brought into us, and that was what saved my life. It, it's what showed me that there are other people like me that we're not failures, that we, there is a better way, that we do recover. And I looked forward to those meetings, and uh, the people that dedicated themselves to helping us changed my life. It, it showed me that people do still care about us. There's a terrible stigma that goes along with suffering from mental health issues and alcoholism and addiction. And it's very easy to just picture that junkie on the street that we see, you know, shuffling along with their tattered clothing and thinking of that it's somebody that's going to steal from you, which a lot of times, that's the other thing I wanted to mention is the majority of people that are in prison or programs due to their substance abuse issues, their crimes are usually committed as a way, as a means of, ways and means to get more, to, to get more of whatever substance they need to get the money to do that. And it's not at all an excuse, but it's a, it's a terrible cycle. And rehabilitation is the key. If, if I hadn't received any of these groups that came in to help us, if I hadn't had just that little bit of work every day, my story might be different. If I hadn't, I was also able to go into a kind of a transitional program, which is what this program helps a lot of women do. That helped me to get back into society and to not just be plucked out and dropped off and say, here you go, figure it all out again, which I had to do a lot of the figuring out, but a transitional, um, program, help finding a job and things like that was very, very important. I never ever imagined that I would be returning to school. I would have my life in order. I have a family. I've got a one-year-old daughter. And I am able to give them all of myself. I'm able to be devoted. And before, all I was devoted to was my addiction. So I know from personal experience that these programs are just so, so important for changing the lives of people and for helping society. It helps society to have people come out and have the ability to get a job and to not sit at home and just hope that they can be helped by everybody else. It helps people to help themselves, which is what people with these issues really, really need help with. And not to say that all these women are there under substance abuse, substance abuse issues, but they do have to live under a very strict criteria and guidelines for being able to participate in this program, which means that they don't, you know, that they're not very violent and things like that, not violent crimes and, and things of that nature. So hopefully today we have enlightened you and helped you see the importance of this program. There's all kinds of information here on this board. There is uh, the number and the website there up in the corner here if anybody does want more information. information they do accept donations of all different kinds, not just monetary, just dog food, things like that too. It's a very important program. So today, Alfie and I have told you about the program. We've told you about what a service dog is. We've told you how this is so significant to the inmates. And I've shared with you a personal side. So hopefully you have enjoyed hearing about this. And thank you all for coming.